Okay, that works. All right, everyone. Um, we're going to get started here. So, um, first things first, my name is Logan. Um, I'm going to be your TA for this course, so it's going to be awesome. Um, first of all, you should have all gotten a paper um, with all the speakers on it. Um, if you didn't, we have extras in the back. It's also on the, on the syllabus page. There's a link to all the speakers with more detailed bios about them. Uh, but we're super excited for our lineup this semester. Lots of really cool, really successful people coming. So look ahead, right? Make sure your schedule stays open. You come. Um, so this little paper, um, starting next week, you're going to get one of these every week, OK? Um, this is basically your attendance. So. Long story short, you're going to write your first and last name and any number if you didn't get that. And then you're going to write down five things you learned, right? And this is how we're going to take your attendance for the class, okay? So once you write all your five things you learned during class, there can be more than five, okay? Um, you're going to hand them to me at the end of the class, okay? I need you to hand them to me, not your friend, okay? Not like a collective thing. Ha please hand them to me. Um, and remember to take a picture before you give it to me because there are really a lot of valuable things you can learn in this class and you might not get your paper back. So, um, but yeah, that's how I'll take your attendance. That's going to be the main part of your grade. Um, one more thing before we get started here is before Monday, I need everyone to go to the syllabus page of the course. Um, there's a link to a dinner survey. So reminder, if you're signed up for the class, um, you have the opportunity to have dinner and network with one of these awesome entrepreneurs that are going to come, okay? And there's a survey just right on the Canvas page for the syllabus. You need to fill that out by Monday, otherwise things might not go super good. So, um, yeah. I think that's about it. I just want to introduce a couple people before we get started. Um, we have a few interns here from the Center for Entrepreneurship. Also Paige Longhurst. Yeah, that's Paige. She's awesome. She's like, does a lot of stuff there. Um, and we've got Andy Tunnell. Um, and then next up here in a second, um, we're going to have Dr. Mike Glauser come and speak to us. He's going to be our speaker today. And he's awesome. Okay. He's like ran a marathon over the Inca Trail in Peru. He's biked across the United States 4,000 miles. He's a serial entrepreneur. Um, so really excited to have him speak to us. And uh, he's going to tell you a lot more cool things. So let's welcome Dr. Glazer, guys. Thanks, Logan. OK, welcome. It's great to have you here. Um, this is our 13th annual Entrepreneur Leadership Series. And this is uh, one of our very, very favorite classes that we teach. We try to bring some of the finest entrepreneurs from Utah and around the country into this classroom so you have an opportunity to actually hear them speak and then meet with some of them for dinner, network with them. Some of our employees have actually obtained jobs from some of these speakers. And we try to have a real variety of speakers. We try to have men and women and old and young and tech entrepreneurs and entertainers. And uh, you probably noticed we have John Schmidt from The Piano Guys has agreed to come to a little concert and a speech on how he used social media to build uh, billions of followers. Uh, when I last talked to John, uh, uh, people pay $100,000 for the piano guys to do one concert. And he recently did a concert. He did 13 concerts in Europe. So they're just killing it right now. And so he's going to be here. We have people that have started clothing companies. We have students that were here. Uh, Travis Chambers just sold his company for $17 million. He was one of our students. We have some current students that have a very successful business. And so you'll see men, you'll see women, you'll see old, you'll see young, you'll see all kinds of companies. And our goal really is to show you all the different ways that you could uh, provide for yourself, create something that's special, that's unique, that you love doing, and there's a lot of different ways to do it. The first thing I want to do, though, is um, I want you to think about this question. What, what do you want to be when you grow up? Okay. While you're thinking about that, let me ask, how many of you have taken this class before? Raise your hand if you've taken it before. You can take it as many times as you want while you're here, okay? Great, we have a few of you. Uh, how many of you are uh, majoring in a business topic? Okay, excellent. And of course, the rest of you, raise your hand anyway. How many of you are non-business students? Okay, we love all of our students. Uh, the Entrepreneurship Center serves every student from every major across the state of Utah. Uh, you may be surprised to know that 67% of our students in our courses are non-business students. 
So we love having all of you here tonight. Uh, how many of you know exactly what you want to be when you grow up? You know what you want to study, you know what you want to do, you know what your career is. If you know, raise your hand. Okay. We have three. Okay. Awesome. Oh, four. We have four. Okay. Uh, I want you to be brave and come up here, two of you, and tell us what that is. Okay. Would you be willing to do that? And then how about you? So introduce yourself and say, what's your, what's your plan? What's the path? What are you going to do? Okay. Come on. Yeah. We need you to come up here so those online can see and hear. Okay. Hi, my name is Kennedy Finley. I want to run my own business. I already graduated from Bridgerland doing uh, fashion merchandising and development, and I want to use all of the stuff I learned from learning how to promote sustainable fashion and create my own fashion label. Fantastic. Congratulations. Okay. How many, come on up. Yeah. So another question, how many of you have actually started a business before or you have one now? Okay, good. Quite a few of you. Okay, give us your name and what are you going to do? I'm Larson Rupp and I'm studying aerospace engineering or mechanical engineering with an aerospace emphasis. And I'd like to design aircraft for a defense company. So. Fantastic. Way to go. Congratulations. Okay, so my next question is what's wrong with the rest of you? We only have four people that know what they're going to do with their lives. I'm just kidding. I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. So uh, it doesn't matter. I want you to know that it does not matter. Don't worry if you don't know what you're going to do exactly. Okay. So when I was your age in school, I, I was really concerned about what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I went and took those interest tests, the strong Campbell interest tests. Have any of you taken interest tests to see what you'd enjoy doing during your life? Okay, quite a few of you. Uh, they're really valuable. They're really helpful. What they do is they measure what engages you, what lights you up, what, what could you do all day long and not get bored. And so this, these are my results, okay? The, it came back. Uh, one of the things you have to understand is there's not just one thing you love, but there might be three or four, three to five things that you could do. And the key is to pick the right one that'll give you the best future. So a surgeon, a musician, or an entrepreneur, what in the heck is that all about? What, what is the relationship between those? They seem very different to me. What do you think? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, creativity, maybe helping, serving, and so on and so forth. So I knew I didn't want to go through medical school for eight to 12 years. I didn't really like biology and science. I would have loved being a doctor. I still think it's a fabulous profession. Uh, so I started looking at musician and entrepreneur. And I loved music. So I actually, I, I'm a music major. I majored in music composition during my undergraduate days. And I learned to write music for films and shows and so on. And, and I actually toured uh, in some bands and played on different parts. I toured Europe one time. And it was an awesome experience, but it was kind of a grind. And it was a little bit hard to make money doing that. So I said, I'm going to go to the next one, the third one. And I went back to school, did a master's degree and a PhD in organizational studies. And the goal was that I thought it would be really cool to create organizations, for profit, non profit, it didn't matter, that were really awesome places to work, that solved problems, uh, that added value to people's lives, and that were places people would love to work, that were treated really well. I thought if I could learn to do that, that would be really cool. And so that's what I did, and I've had four careers since then. Let me show you my career path. That's when I was your age as a musician right there, many years ago. And then I switched to professor after I got my PhD. Then I left the university and uh, built companies for about 10 years, built and sold some companies. Then I decided to be a consultant to people who are also trying to build and, and sell companies. Then I had three years where I was a professional speaker, and now I'm back to being a professor. So four or five different careers. This is more like what you are going to do, and that's why I say don't worry, okay? This is the old-fashioned career path. Uh, very few people do this, so we had four people in this room that have tracked that path for themselves. Uh, no one, hardly anyone, uh, goes to school, gets a degree, and works somewhere for 40 years anymore. But what happens is we have to be continuous learners. We have to be constantly learning, and we'll learn and prepare, and we'll have an opportunity. 
And then if you do really well in that opportunity, you, you network and you meet people and you learn about industries and then a new opportunity arises. Then you jump to that opportunity. You might do that four or five times during your career. And so the key is not that you know exactly what you're going to do, but that you have a set of skills that will allow you to create your own job if you want to do that and create your own business or at least really add value to any company that you work for. If you can't innovate, solve problems, and add value, you're going to have a really rough time in your career. If you can do these things, you can be successful just about anywhere, and if you choose, you can start your own business. Um, the reason this is so important right now is that uh, work is changing dramatically. Uh, technology is significantly changing the way we work, and jobs are coming online, and then they're going away, and then new jobs are coming online and going away. So Andy and I jumped in a van a few years ago, and we went to, to speak with experts, scholars, researchers, that knew what work might look like over the next 20 years. Because we're educators, we want to help to prepare you. And here's a short video of some of the people that we met with. The future of work as a result of technology is going to be the biggest change in the 21st century as industrialization changed the world centuries ago. We're at a fundamental shift right now. In a world driven by incredibly rapid and accelerating change, this era of entrepreneurship and this era in the economy in general is unprecedented. What technology has been good at for a few decades now is replacing routine work. This could lead to fundamental changes in reality, how they work. It's going to be so hugely disruptive. It's affecting workers and jobs and wages in ways that we have not seen before. Imagine what that does to the trucking industry. Everyone's talking about the driverless car. When all the trucks drive themselves, they can drive 24 hours a day. Within 10 years, we're not going to be allowed to drive because it's just going to be deemed unsafe. And if you breathe on it, it'll tell you whether you have lung cancer or not. No occupation is off limits. Robots are doing more accurate surgeries than the surgeons. The bank teller, the payroll clerk. We don't need you anymore. I honestly believe I am going to live to see a science fiction economy where our mines, our factories, warehouses, our farms, highways are staffed almost exclusively by machines. We're just going to automate the work. Anybody who takes charge of their own economic destiny regardless of the scale, for me as an entrepreneur. We literally started by selling Ziploc bags of this powdered drink mix that we made in a hardware store. I was pretty sick of doing what I was doing. I just kept feeling like, man, like this can't be my life. Like I'm too creative for this. I remember thinking, wouldn't it be just the greatest thing ever if we could actually get paid doing this? I ordered 5,000 skirts, and I didn't know how to build a business. How do you come up with a sample of something that's never been done before? I have to create my own destiny. Taking that bold step is is what 3 x my company. I do this because this is my dream. You can do whatever the hell you want. Stop settling for a mediocre job. Stop being such a wuss. You know, if ever there was a reason to be self-employed, change my whole life. I'm not going back to work. I'm doing something on my own. Put on your big boy pants and get to freaking work. Okay, so learning how uncertain the future is going to be, we thought, okay, what are we going to start teaching our students? How do you best prepare? And we really believe that entrepreneurial skills is what we all need. We call it entrepreneurial leadership. Whether you work for a corporation, a nonprofit, a church, or a school, or a government, or whether you create your own business, you need a unique set of skills to navigate this new landscape. And our role is to try to help you develop those skills regardless of what you're majoring in and regardless of what your uh, future job might be. And so after interviewing almost a thousand entrepreneurs now, we've come up with some concepts that we're going to teach you uh, that will make a huge difference in your career and a big difference in starting your own business. So here's just a quick summary of what that video talked about. You can see that accounting, retail, uh, education, uh, delivery jobs, manufacturing, uh, 
the employment shift is significant. That one study that you saw was from Oxford University. It said 40% of the current, 47% of the current jobs will be gone by 2035. So if you're trying to prepare for a specific job, it might not be around. So the key is then to develop a skill set that is valuable. I like to show a few pictures of some of the new technologies. This is an Amazon Go store. There are no employees at all. You walk in and it registers that you're in the store on your app. And as you pull things off the shelf, it transmits that product to your app. And then it just charges your Apple account. Uh, Domino's is now delivering pizzas by delivery drone. Amazon is building airfields. They're going to build 24 airfields and deliver all their packages up to 40 pounds by drone. Uh, of course, smart cars. My son lives in San Francisco, and they've introduced smart cars. They're legal uh, on all the city streets, but you have to apply to be able to ride in one. And if you're perceived to be an old person, you can get one of those permits. If you're a young single guy like my son, they don't care if he dies, so he got one of those permits. So he rides all around San Francisco without ever having a driver in the car. He's been doing it for about six months. Uh, of course, anything that can be manufactured is now being made by uh, robots, automobiles, uh, pharmaceuticals, security. This uh, is a, a surgical robot called Da Vinci that does more accurate surgeries than surgeons. And... Uh, a few years ago, I took my grandson skiing, and he was only three years old. So all day long, I was he had I had him between my knees, and I was bent over like this all day, you know, walking along. And when I got home that night, I had a huge bulge. I had a hernia, basically. I blew a hernia. So I needed to have surgery, and I went to see the surgeon, and he said, Mike, we've got three choices. We've got the traditional surgery. We're, we're going to cut you open, put a patch in. We do mostly that. Or we could put a scope in and make a small incision and hand repair it with a scope. Or he said, we've got this really cool new robot. I don't know if you're going to be willing to have a robot do the surgery. And I said, sign me up. I want the robot to do it. So this isn't me under the table, but that's the robot that did surgery on me. And it was awesome. I was up walking the next day. Uh, minimally invasive. This is kind of one of the creepiest things. These are called humanoids, and they're huge in uh, Japan and in China. They're actually able to make robots with the same texture of skin and hair that look and act like real people. And they imbue them with about 50,000 bits of information so they can think and act. And there are hotel chains in Japan that are run by these humanoids. There's no humans. They're robots that run the uh, hotel. So they'll check you in. They'll deliver room service. They'll carry your bags to your room, uh, whatever you need done. So these are some of the key skills that you're going to need to navigate this new economy. And I'm introducing them to you briefly tonight so you can watch for these in the speakers. We, as we interview these hundreds and hundreds of entrepreneurs. Uh, they're almost exactly the same. They talk about the same things. Here's why I did the business. Here's how I found my first customers. Here's how I financed the company. Here's how I scaled and added additional products to my product line. And the last one's a newer one that research has just shown in the last about five years that people that are happy that have emotional well-being do far better in entrepreneurship and in their careers. And so that's the one I mostly want to talk about tonight. But let's go through, through these real quickly. Um, of all the people we've interviewed, hundreds of them, up to a thousand, what percentage of those do you think said, I started this business just to make money? What's your guess? What percent of success? These are very successful entrepreneurs. How many of them are doing it just to make money? What would you guess? Just throw out a number. You can talk. It's okay. 10%? 3%? 95%? That's a pretty big range. We have 3% to 95%. 50? 1%? Percent. Zero. Okay. 3%. 3% of successful entrepreneurs that are gaining traction in industries uh, say that I did this for money. The rest of them almost never even mentioned in these interviews, these oral history interviews. They had some reason for doing it that was really engaging and really motivating. And you'll, you'll learn that starting a business 
and keeping it sustainable is hard work. And if you're doing it just to make money, you're far more likely to bail out. But if you're driven by something, you want to create a new product, you want to give better service to customers, you want to do something that you love, you want to live in a certain small town and, and create jobs in that town, if there's something driving you, you're far more likely to be successful. So you need to think about why am I doing this? And is this strong enough to get me through the hard times? So you can see it, it gives you perseverance, it, it promotes excellence, and it attracts people to your business. This is one of the biggest ones. 50% uh, of all new businesses fail, and the reason we think is because they launched an idea, not an opportunity. There's a huge difference between an idea and an opportunity. An idea is something you think up while you're driving your car down the street or while you're taking a shower or sitting on the couch watching TV. But an opportunity has some very specific components to it. And we have a training model that we teach you to vet business ideas to see if they're true opportunities or not. And these are five of the qualities. We call this the NERCA model. But you have to have real evidence that there are buying customers out there, that people are saying, I got a problem. And if you can solve it, I would like your product. You've got to have some experience um, with that product line or that industry, but the interesting thing is you don't have to have worked in the industry, you have to be a consumer of the products. We call you user entrepreneurs. So if you're using a product line and something's missing, you're a perfect entrepreneur to fix that problem, even if you don't work in the industry. Uh, you don't need money, but you need resources to cobble together a prototype that you can test. Uh, you want to do an experiment, test it, get some feedback. Iterate, improve it, test it, get some feedback. So you don't need a lot of money. Uh, saying I need money to start a business is just an excuse. Uh, you have to have customers buy right off the bat. You have to have cash flow, which you vetted from number one, right? They said, if you create it, I'll buy it. You have to have them buy it and grow with your cash flow. And then, of course, the numbers have to work. Uh, you have to be making more money than you're spending. We usually like to see about a 50% gross margin and a 10% to 20% profit margin. Uh, those businesses are then sustainable. So launch an opportunity, not an idea. And you'll hear a lot of people talk about failures that they had, and it's because they launched an idea, and these five components were not present. You need mentors. Uh, you need to build a team around you of people that know you well, that you can go to, that can answer questions, that can introduce you to people. So you build this large brain trust. People are more successful if they have mentors around them than if they don't. Uh, you have to be extremely efficient. These are two important business concepts. Effectiveness is you're achieving your goals. Efficiency is you're doing it with as few resources as you possibly can. So you're bootstrapping. You're doing everything you can to get something into the market at the lowest cost possible. And there are always ways to do things with less money. Uh, you have to be phenomenal at giving customer service. We're building communities nowadays, and people buy from people that they like. Everyone goes to a business with certain expectations, and if you meet those expectations for them, they'll say they're satisfied, but they're not loyal until you exceed their expectations. And the highest order of success in building communities is let your customers actually be part of the business. Use them as a source of feedback. Make them partners. Let them test your products. Uh, give them incentives to help you develop and improve your product line. This one's kind of interesting. In this new economy, you need to think of yourself as Me, Inc., you know, or Me, LLC. No one is going to take care of you during your lifetime. Not the government, not a corporation. You have to say, I've got to generate revenue streams for myself, and how am I going to do that? And you might end up creating uh, two or three products. Uh, you might start, you need to start investing at an early age. I tell college graduates, go out and uh, figure out a way to buy a duplex. Uh, buy something and start generating some equity and start building a portfolio of investments. And, uh, but, but think about taking care of yourself and having multiple, multiple opportunities. This one kind of surprised us when we started doing these interviews that these successful entrepreneurs were heavily involved in giving back to their communities. They were teaching in high schools. They were donating products. They were helping with uh, cancer research. Uh, they were just giving back to the community that helped them be successful. And what that does, does is it endears that community to you. That they, You have to have a great product, and you have to give great service. But if you're also doing something valuable to the community, then that is associated with long-term sustainability. 
Okay, here's the one I want to talk about. For years, for decades, we thought that if you could simply succeed in your life and your career, you would be happy. Okay? So if I get a good degree, man, I'm going to be happy as soon as I get that degree. If I get a good job, I'm going to be real happy as soon as I get that job. As soon as I uh, find a partner that I love, as soon as I buy a house, as soon as I have some nice cars, uh, the research now is showing very clearly that there's no link between success and happiness. At best, it's really fuzzy, and at worst, it's non-existence. None of those things are going to make us happy. There's this growing body of research studies have been done on about a million people now that show that if we can figure out how to really have joy and be happy and feel good about ourselves and feel good about other people, that that is what is the key driver to success in your job and in your career. So this is what the research is showing. Uh, people who are happy at work and in their professions have all those advantages over people that are struggling. Makes sense, don't you think? Okay, so part of what we teach in the Center of Entrepreneurship, not only do we teach those skills we just reviewed, but uh, we have a whole new project on how do we help create whole individual entrepreneurs that are healthy and happy and enthused and have great skills. Here's the challenge that we're facing. I track all the latest research every year from the CDC and the National Institute for Mental Health. These are the statistics from 2022. Just take a minute and look at those numbers. Your age group, most of you, 33%, one out of three had a diagnosable mental illness uh, that received some kind of treatment last year. That number's huge. The high school numbers are very, very frightening. So what I'd like to ask you now is, wh why do you think this is happening? If all the years I've been tracking this data, this is the worst it's ever been. Why do you think? I want some of you to be brave and uh, tell us why you think this trend is escalating right now. There's no right or wrong answer, just what do you think? What have you seen? How many of you know someone that is struggling with an emotional illness? Okay, pretty much everyone here. How many of you know of a suicide in a neighborhood or church or, okay. See, that's frightening, that's half of you. Okay, so why is this going on? You willing to come up? This is building character, you're brave. Tell us your name and just what do you think? Okay, my name's Liza, and I think a big part of why mental illness is increasing is because we're replacing genuine connection with fake, like, dopamine hits of social media that's not real connection in our lives. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Let's give her a hand. That was awesome. Okay, what else? Let's see if one more, one more person's willing. I saw a hand somewhere in the back. You want to come up? Hi, my name is Aiden. Um, I think a big reason for why um, mental health problems and mental health issues are on the rise uh, is because everything is always on fire. <laughs> um, <clears throat> economic turmoil for, uh, for a lot of people, as well as just like the amount of stuff that we've all dealt with in the last four to six years from COVID to earthquakes and fires and natural disasters. And I feel like a lot of that has a big, a big chunk of why we're all feeling kind of hopeless like this graph is telling us. Great. Thank you so much for coming up. <clears throat> okay, so this is a complicated situation. We don't know for sure, but there are some factors. Uh, one factor is we're, we're the highest user of uh, mental health medication, the United States of any country in the world. And one, one reason is that we're not ashamed to talk about our emotional challenges anymore. And uh, doctors are prescribing more meds here than in other countries. Um, we've had a lot of uh, catastrophes that are very frightening, uh, financial and health. But, but everyone agrees, everyone that we've interviewed and the research agrees that one of the biggest changes is that uh, social media and technology are changing dramatically the way we interact with each other. 
correct. So you, you said it exactly that we went from having close friendships, five or six or eight close friends. We hang out with all the time and go to lunch with and balance each other's thoughts and help each other through crisis. We went to having way more connections, but we're more isolated than we've ever been. And human beings do not do well in isolation. We just do not do well alone. So what we've done is we have searched for three years to find some key principles that have actually been proven by scientific research that can produce a change in mental health and emotional health in real time. Okay, so if you do these things today, you're going to be a lot better off today. And I want to briefly review what some of those things are, and this is a part of our new happiness project, which is part of the Center for Entrepreneurship. Okay, the first one. We've thought of the ego to mean in Western culture that you're really proud, you're really haughty, you think you're a gift to the world. But throughout history and in the sciences, the ego is defined as a composite of all of your self-perceptions. It's everything you think about yourself. All those perceptions, are you tall or are you short? Are you thick? Are you thin? Are you athletic? Are you clumsy? Are you smart? Are you not very smart? Are you motivated? Are you lazy? All those things are fabrications. They're not real. So when we look at the uh, philosophical literature and the new research and even the spiritual liter literature, they all say we have two selves. We have a human self that is our true potential, and as humans, we can do amazing things. We're not even tapping, tapping the surface of what we can do as humans. But then we develop this artificial ego, which are all these self-perceptions that we carry around with us in our head, and they set bounds and limitations on what we do. And so the first step in achieving a better mental health or happiness is to say, hey, this is not who I am. All these things I think about myself, that's not really me. They've come from feedback I've gotten when I was younger, from teachers and from parents and from peers. And I've developed this framework, this gestalt that is just, it's who I've uh, uh, built myself to be, but it's not really me. And so as soon as you can shed these perceptions and say, you know what, I'm a work in progress. And there's a lot of things that I can do. And I can improve myself in this area. And uh, when, you, when you develop that attitude, life gets a lot better. You're not carrying around these burdens in your head that you're not good enough or that you can't do this or you can't do that. I sometimes tell this funny story. I fell in love with this beautiful woman and uh, asked her to marry me. We've been married for 44 years. I still lo I love her more now than I did before. And I took her home to meet my parents and told them we're going to get married. And my dad said to Mary, I, I need to chat with you about Mike for a minute. My dad was a really strange guy, and he took her in his den and told her things that were wrong about me to warn. He felt his obligation as my dad to say, you know, he's pretty messy, uh, and he doesn't care about money. And she came out and laughed, and, and so I decided right then and there, okay, I'm going to be the cleanest guy I've ever been, and I'm going to care about money and manage money well. And, and so I made that change just like that, okay? And we can do that. It's easy to make changes when we're really committed to make those changes. And we have a whole process for how you can change limiting self-perceptions. So step number one is you have to realize that these things you feel about yourself, they're not real. Uh, the Buddhists and the Hindus from the spiritual literature, they call it the illusionary self. Okay? We all have an illusionary self. So I've gotten some examples here of people that have made incredible changes in their life as a result of these principles. And this is one that Emerson knows this guy. He's one of my favorite role models. Um, looking at Dave, you have no idea that Dave spent 20 years in prison in Los Angeles. Um, he was the leader of the white skinhead group in the prison. He held the keys to the yard, which meant he was the leader of that group the time that he was in prison. I mean, he was very, very bad dude. He ran guns, he sold drugs, he uh, was abusive. I mean, he was, he was a really awful individual. And the judge allowed him to go to a place called Delancey Street to give him one last chance to erase a 22-year prison term, which would have put him in prison for the rest of his life. He got out and he went right back in. And the judge says, I don't think you're going to make it, but if you can change who you are in this program, I'm going to erase that prison term. And he really started realizing that when I was younger, I loved people. 
and I was a good guy. And I just fell in with the wrong crowd. I, I learned that it was easy to be a leader of losers. And uh, he started uh, helping and serving the people in their Delancey Street. He started helping the new residents as they came in. And he started really giving and thinking a lot less of himself. And he said, I just simply took off the black hat and put on the white half. And I never looked back. And now he's the leader of one of the most successful rehabilitation programs in the world for convicted felons and uh, drug abusers, drug addicts. And one of the happiest guys I know. Emerson? He's pretty happy, isn't he? So these role models, I show them to you because you, I hope you're saying, gosh, if that guy can do it, I can probably rethink and reinvent some things about myself. Now, this is interesting that once we start judging ourselves less harshly and we get up and say, hey, I've got weaknesses, but I'm a work in progress and I can keep growing and life is fun and I'm going to work on these things. What happens? It's really interesting. Then we quit judging other people. We give ourselves a break. So we start giving other people a break. We just quit judging based on superficial cues. So what happens is we see someone of a certain color, a certain race, a certain ethnicity, a certain religion, a certain political party, a certain weight. And because humans are complex and we don't know everything about them, we fill in all the missing pieces with a fabricated personality. So not only do we have an illusionary self that puts bounds on us, we have these illusionary, illusionary perceptions of other people. And again, the science shows that if we can quit judging others, if we can cut them some slack and just get to know them, look at all the cool things that happen. We start liking people. We overlook their weaknesses. We're happier. We have more friendships. One of the uh, teachings of uh, Buddha that we came across in this research, he, he said there's three kinds of people uh, in the world with regard to holding on to anger. He said the first person is like a line etched in stone. You know, it's not going away for a long time. The second person is like a line etched in the dirt. It stays for a while and then it dissipates. And he said the happy person, the third person, is the one that's like a line etched in water. They don't take offense in the first place. Okay. So if we can quit judging people based on these real superficial cues, we have a broader pool of friend, friends, a broader pool of friendships, and we start enjoying people, ourselves, and other people more. The role model that I use and have gotten to know here is R. Shea Cooper. We had him come speak in this lecture series. Uh, he grew up in Chicago in the midst of the gangs. He, he had to cross through three gang territories to get to school. Manly High School was, was the most violent high school in Chicago. He stepped over dead bodies. He was beat up. He was shot at. He had to wear the right colors. He had to wear his hat the right way. And, and one day, a couple came to the school and said, we want to start a sculling team, a rowing team. And we want to get a bunch of you to join this team and get in this boat with us. Well, they weren't having it. They were all from different gangs, and they weren't going to sit in a boat together. And they finally convinced some of them to start rowing together. And they started rowing regularly and entering competitions. And what they realized is the hatred they had for each other was not based on any experiences that they had ever had. It was based on things they had heard about each other. And they realized that they all had had trauma. They joined gangs to have family. They were lonely. They'd been abused. And they started liking each other. And they became best friends. And they thought, you know, if it works for different uh, rival gang members, we think it will work for the Chicago Police Department. So they went and got some cops from the Chicago Police Department to join their rowing club. And you can see there in the boat, every other person is a, is a white guy, a white police officer. And the same thing happened. They became really good friends. They realized that they have some of the same goals and objectives. They all want to have a good life. They want to have a good family. They want to be happy. And it really made a difference in their community. And so what R. Shea Cooper says, it's, it's easy to hate from a distance. It's hard to hate up close. So if all of our relationships are superficial, it's easy to hate. If we're willing to overlook people's weaknesses and get to know them and look for similarities, that our mental health gets better and our lives get better. So look at the progression. It's like a stairway. First, we work on ourselves. We realize we're not really bound by the perceptions that maybe have been fed to us. And now we're not going to do that and brand and label other people as, as well. Okay, the third step in the progress. Now, if you like people more, you're going to start doing some good things for people. People are good. They're not bad. 
and you start doing good deeds. You start looking for ways to give back. So instead of getting up in the morning and looking in the mirror and, you know, saying me, 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 is my hair right or my clothes right? Did I say the right things? Am I going to do the right things at school? Uh, am I going to get this guy or this girl to like me or this person? Uh, you look in the mirror and you say, yeah, I'm a work in progress. I want to add value to the world. And today I'm going to look for things to do that will make someone else's life better. And you get off this claustrophobic treadmill of self-centeredness. You know, it's like being in a hamster wheel. Me, 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 me. And the research is so clear that if you can think more about others, I always say, don't worry about what people think about you. Start worrying about what you think about them. And if you can go out and start doing good deeds, you open the door for someone. You can shovel your neighbor's walks. You can carry someone's groceries in the grocery store. You could pay the toll for the car behind you, which would be awesome. Just start doing cool things. And it, it makes a huge difference in the brain chemicals. It reduces um, cortisol and adrenaline and increases dopamine and uh, GABA and other brain chemicals in real time. So if you think about yourself all day today and then write down how you felt and tomorrow you think about others and do three good deeds and write down how you feel, it makes a difference in real time. It's pretty simple, right? It's, this is probably the most powerful thing you can do to increase your own happiness and well-being and do better in your jobs and in your career. So this is one of my favorite gurus, the wisest person I know. Um, when he was your age in college, he was hit by a car, um, paralyzed from the neck down. And um, uh, he woke up, realized he was never going to walk again, and he wished that he had been killed in the car accident. He, he couldn't imagine life in a wheelchair. And so he started thinking about suicide, different ways to take his life. And, and he couldn't, he can't, couldn't even use his hands. What's he going to do, you know? And so he finally decided there's only one way to survive this. I got to quit thinking about how terrible this is. And I got to start thinking about what I can do for others, even though I'm incapacitated physically. So he started serving his nurses and his doctors and paying more attention to them. And then he went back to school. Um, he got a degree in art and became a teacher. And his whole life, every morning was, how do I add value today? How can I do something for someone else? And if you sit down with John, he's the wisest guy you'll ever meet. And he's just bright. I mean, there's like a bright light that em emulates from him. And he never thinks about himself. And he's doing something for someone all day long and never telling anyone about it. So he's, again, our role model. If he can do it, we can do it. This is a huge holding on to anger here. I've got a few more minutes. If we can let go of the anger that we feel and learn to forgive people and just say, hey, uh, he's a work in progress. I can be different tomorrow, so she could be different tomorrow. And I'm going to let it go. I'm not going to take offense in the first place. Uh, these are all the advantages of not holding on to anger and grudges. Uh, it has a huge impact. There's a professor at the University of Wisconsin. He's done 100 studies on anger and letting go of anger and grudges, and the outcomes are absolutely incredible. So here's our role model here. Um, how many of you listen to the podcast, The Letter? Anyone? Do you know about Cy Snar? Okay, the podcast, The Letter, was the number one podcast in America last year for quite a while. And Cy and Ron, they're actually friends of ours, and their son, Zachary, there was a friend of my son's. And uh, right when he graduated from high school, uh, now August, getting ready to go to college, he was shot and killed by a stranger. Uh, just walked up behind him, shot him in the head, and killed him. And the gentleman got life in prison without parole. He was from Uruguay. He was illegal, illegally in the country. And he shot Zachary and uh, got life in prison. So for about 20 years, Sai was an absolute wreck. She was uh, suicidal. She was angry. She hated life. She hated people. She hated Hispanics because of that one incident. And she was just miserable. And every time we would see her, we'd wonder, where did Sai go? You know, she was a shell of a person. And then I ran into her about uh, a couple of years ago. I hadn't seen her for a while. And she was uh, bright and happy. And I said, Sai, how are you doing? And she says, a miracle has happened. I said, what is that? And she said, I've met the man that killed my son. 
and we are best friends. I love him. I've forgiven him. And I talk to him every week. And so what happened is he wrote her a letter from prison uh, 20 years later and said, um, I was a good kid. I was bullied. I was beaten. I was depressed. I wanted to take my life, but I didn't have the courage to do it. And I thought if I killed someone else, I could kill myself. And, but before he killed himself, the police uh, caught him. And he just said, it's ruined your life. I'm so sorry. It's ruined my life. And then he said, don't, don't hold this against my family. I was raised in a good home. And I don't know if this will help, but I just thought I should tell you that. And so then she wrote him back. And they started, she signed her letters, Sai, and he signed his letters, Jorge. And then she started writing Love, Sai, and then he started writing Love, Jorge. And then she actually got to go uh, on his weekly call. He calls her every Saturday, and they talk for an hour on the phone. And she was then able to go and meet with him in the prison. And, you know, by now he's 46 years old. And she said they just, he walked in, and she didn't recognize him, and they just hugged each other. And he said, I am so sorry. And she said, I know, I know, it's okay. And so now what she's trying to do is they're trying to get him out of prison, even though he got life without parole. But she's a huge advocate for just letting go. When you have a grudge and you're mad at someone, it's like drinking poison yourself and then hoping that person out there dies. It's actually just an absolute killer of positive brain chemistry. So again, if I can do it, we can do it. Okay, this one's kind of interesting. Um, there's a lot of literature that shows that if we become attached to material things, if we love clothes and cars and possessions, uh, we're far less happy than if we see the value in them, but we don't love them and we don't seek them and we don't worship or, or hoard them in any way. And so if we have sufficient for our needs and then we share and we look for ways to share what we have, we're far happier than if we become really attached to the things uh, that are material. Again, the research is very, very clear here. Uh, we're happy or if we build our life around relationships as opposed to around things. So my wife and I uh, remodeled our home a few years ago, and we had to move all the furniture, all the clothes, all the appliances out of the living the upstairs down into the basement while they finished the basement. And when they were finished, we looked at all this stuff and we said, do we really want to take all this stuff back upstairs? And we decided, no, let's, let's try being minimalist for a while. And so we gave away probably 50 to 60% of all of our possessions. Uh, I gave away probably 70% of my clothes. If I hadn't worn it in a year, I gave it away. If we hadn't used it in a year, we gave it away. And I was a little worried, is, am I going to need that someday? And in the last year, I've only, I've only wanted one thing that I gave away out of all those things I gave away. And so now we didn't put any pictures back up on the wall. We put less furniture. And so if you come visit us, you'll go, geez, Mike and Mary have probably fallen on hard times. There's nothing in the house here. But we love it. It's simple. We're, we're, not, we're not hoarding and keeping things. We're giving things away. And it makes a huge difference. And so in this happiness project in the class, this is pretty cool. We have the students, um, you go through your possessions and you have to pick 10 things that uh, you maybe value, but you really don't need. And you have to, you can't just go give them to the Desert Industries or Salvation Army. You have to go find people to give those to that you think would need those. And then the students actually log in a journal what happens. And it's, it's amazing. They come back and say, I didn't realize how self-centered I was and how selfish I was and how attached I was. One student said she gave away four bags of clothes, you know, black garbage bags, four bags full, uh, and realized I don't need all this stuff. So again, just being generous. It's just being generous. Uh, John Huntsman's our role model here. Um, he's given away almost $2 billion. We're the Huntsman School of Business. And people always say, well, yeah, if you're a billionaire, it's easy to give away money. But the interesting thing is John and Karen decided when they got married that they were going to give away some of his paycheck. They were going to find someone in need every month and give away part of his paycheck to that person. That was when they were your age. And so his first paycheck was $300 a month, and he gave away $50 of that all through their early years of marriage. And then it went to 100 and then 1000 and then it went to billions. And um, 
You know, you, you might think, well, I'm, I'm going to start giving and being charitable and kind and generous after I get a job and make some money. But no, the, the habit ne needs to start right now. Just so think about who might need something you have. Realize how fortunate we are. We hit the jackpot in life here. And uh, generosity is a key factor. Uh, the last one is, is pretty interesting. This is kind of a subset of, of doing good deeds, but there are people that are really struggling all around us. Maybe someone just got divorced. Maybe someone lost a child or a spouse. Maybe someone was fired from a job. Maybe someone is struggling with depression. And the message here is to find one person that you're uniquely qualified to help and plug into their life and see what you can do. This is not just a random act of kindness today, but this is something you're going to do for a few months and really decide you're going to help be that mentor that helps that person through that struggle, through that challenge. And again, the research is just, it's undeniable that you're far happier if you do that. How many of you know someone that is struggling right now? Okay, every hand goes up. <laughs> this is really easy, easy to do. So this is a woman in our seed program in Manila. I, I call her the lumber queen of Manila. She, we've helped her build a lumber business over the years. And she's the most generous person that I've ever met. She now owns, she makes thousands of dollars, uh, very wealthy for a Filipino. She hires people. She pays for their housing. She pays for their meals. And she teaches all of these women in her village how to start their own businesses like she has done. And again, it just makes a huge difference in the world if we're willing to do that. Okay, let's wrap it up here. Okay, so here, here's the summary, is that we know there's a range of physical illnesses, right? We can be very f healthy over here on the left, good health, everything's working. Or we can have a short-term illness, and we can treat that ourselves, just go get some medication. Or we might have an illness that requires some treatment. We might break a bone or have an infection. Or we might really have a serious problem, kidney failure, cancer, or whatever. We all accept that, right? It's no problem being physically sick. We know we're going to be physically sick at times. Now, there are things we can do to stay healthy physically, but we now know the same is true of mental health. The continuum exists. It would be foolish to think you're not going to go back and forth along this continuum. Stuff happens. The world's on fire. So hopefully we're going to have good health most of the time, but there are things that we can do to treat ourselves. We can go talk to someone. We can read some literature. We can, you know, watch some self-help videos. Uh, if it gets more serious, we're probably going to go need, see, need to see a counselor, and there's no shame whatsoever in that. You should never feel uh, bad about yourself because you need help. And then, of course, sometimes it gets really, really bad. And so to recognize that there's this continuum I'm going to bounce around on, but there are things that I can do to stay in that box on the left. And those are the things we just talked about. The cool thing is that 40 years of research now has shown that happiness is actually a skill. It's not in the DNA. We, we have different genes. Some of us have more happy genes than others, naturally. But this is an actual skill that we develop like any other skill. Uh, this is uh, Richard Davidson is one of the top neuroscientists in the country right now. And this is his final statement that it's, you know, emotional well-being is no different than learning to play an instrument. Okay. He uses cello. I think cellos are really hard to play. As a music uh, composition major, I could play things with frets and the piano. If he said it's like learning to play the piano, it would be more encouraging. But it's like learning to play an instrument, okay? And so if you consciously take responsibility for your emotional health and your own happiness, and you say, you know what? There are things that I can do to be happy physically, and there are things that I can do to be hap happy emotionally. And if you actually do those things, uh, your life's going to be a lot better. And you're going to be a more successful entrepreneur. You're going to be a more successful employee. You're going to be a more successful leader. You're going to do better in your jobs and in, in your career. And that's why this is important to us at the Center for Entrepreneurship. OK, so this is what we do in our center. Um, our job is to help create leadership, entrepreneurial leaders. 
Uh, we do that in a number of ways. We have this whole sequence of courses. You can do a minor in entrepreneurship. It attaches to every single major here at Utah State, and you learn the skills of entrepreneurial leadership. This class is one of our attempts to help you learn those. You're going to learn from those 11 phenomenal speakers that are going to come. Uh, you're going to hear some of the same things that we've talked about. And then the Happiness Project, this is a new course. It's offered both online and in person. We have some phenomenal instructors, and basically you learn how to apply the skills of emotional well-being and how they can benefit your life and your career, okay? So pretty cool. I think we're going to stop right there. What I'd love to do now is uh, have a conversation and just answer any questions that you have. What do you want to ask about uh, the class, entrepreneurial skills, our happiness project? You can ask anything. Yeah. What specifically have you seen um, change in your life as you shifted to like a more minimalist lifestyle? Okay, so uh, the question was, those people online don't hear the questions. The question is, what happens when you change your life to a minimalist lifestyle? Is that pretty much it? What specifically have you seen? Okay. Well, uh, the first... You know, we have more stuff. We, we work all over the world in our seed program, and people live in very humble circumstances. And we see that they're extremely happy. And so the first thing is to, you know, think through your needs versus your want. What are the, your wants? What do you need? You need shelter. You need food. You need some friendship. But then all the other stuff, do you need that? And mostly it's material possessions. Um, think of things that you have that maybe that you don't need, have less furniture, maybe less pictures, less clothes, uh, and just try it and see what happens. We have a whole a process you go through to evaluate, you know, what you have and what you need and what you're able to live without and what that might do for you. So you just have to try it, basically. You all know these things. You didn't hear anything new tonight that you haven't heard before. The problem is we don't do them. And so in our classes, we actually require you to, to test the principles to see if they work and to gain conviction in your own life that this is something I want to keep doing. Okay? So great question. What else do you want to ask? Yeah. Um, at what point did you start to see failure as a stepping stone rather than a setback completely? Okay. Yeah, failure... Um, we look at failure as something personal. Like, I tried this and it didn't work, and I'm not a very smart person. I'm not a very good person. But really, the best teachers by far are failures. We learn far more from our hard times than we do from our good times. If all we do is have good times, we de develop this false, fabricated ego. We start thinking that we're pretty cool. But when you have a failure, you got to look at it as a learning experience. The, the best entrepreneurs have had failures before they've had successes. And we know venture capitalists, investors, that won't invest in any entrepreneur that hasn't had a few failures. So you look at failures not as a failure that's something personal against you, but you're testing an experiment, and the experiment didn't work. So now you know not to do that next time. So to build a business, you're doing a sequence of experiments. You're seeing, does this work? No. Throw it out. Does this work? Throw it out. Until you find something that gains some traction. So failure's not a good word for it. It's, it's testing and experimentation and recalibrating is how to look at that. Okay, another great question. Uh, what else? Yeah, please. Uh, what are some of the resources that Utah State offers aside from this class for networking opportunities? Okay, so the... Um, this event is kind of our initial class. You'll meet lots of people in the class. We have, always have a social afterwards, a networking social for an hour. We serve you Aggie ice cream, and we hang out and we talk. We get to know each other. You get to come to dinner and meet the entrepreneurs to build more of a network. But if you uh, join our classes um, and you're actually building a business, we have a whole bunch of mentors that we can assign to students. We have a board of about 30 fabulous entrepreneurs, investors, CEOs, uh, we have access to help with digital media, legal help, uh, just a lot, a lot of mentors that we have that are willing to help students that are building businesses. But the classes are the best place to start. You're actually um, going to build a business in the classes. It's not theory and research. It's you have to come up with some ideas and then test those ideas. And then you have to build a brand for those ideas. And then you have to figure out how would I scale and grow this. So you actually do real entrepreneurship and you get credit, school credit for doing it. It's pretty cool. Okay, one more and then our time's up. Anything else? 
This is your opportunity. Don't be shy. Yeah, please. Okay, I, I think, um, again, um, we interviewed hundreds of entrepreneurs to create these courses. And we, from A to Z, outlined the steps they have taken to be successful. And so the courses are really designed to teach you principle number one, principle number two, principle number three, and so on. And so it's really a fast track for gaining experience as an entrepreneur and being able to test ideas with the feedback of other class members and other professors and other mentors. But the, the most important thing is you got to find the right opportunity. You got you to gotta launch a real opportunity. So you have to do all the front end work to know if this is actually going to work, that it has a higher probability for success. If, if people launch an opportunity, not an idea, we think the success rate goes up to 80 or 90 percent. So you got to be really thoughtful about what you're going to do and when you're going to start it. Okay, awesome. So next week we have a great lecture. Uh, the Finleys, the, start, the founders of Albion Fitness will be here. We will have dinner with them with some of you at 5 o'clock. We'll let you know who was selected based on your dinner survey. And then we'll have the networking social with Aggie Ice Cream in the lobby. So we really start the class next week, okay? So thanks for being in the class. We love having you here. We think you're going to enjoy it. See you next week.